to getting settled, let me encourage you to take a Bible and open it with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. To the great letter of the Apostle Paul, his first letter to the saints in Corinth. I'll give you plenty of time to turn back there to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're glad that you're here this morning. American Express years ago made the slogan famous. Membership has its privileges. And the idea, of course, was that there are many credit cards out there that aren't going to charge you a, a yearly membership fee. And we acknowledge that. And, and we acknowledge that, that, that we are charging a, a yearly fee in order for the, the privilege of having an American Express card. But we want you to know in commercial after commercial after commercial after commercial that even though that fee is there, membership has its privileges and not everybody has one of these special gold cards. What we're talking about this morning is not any sort of membership tied to credit cards or a gym membership or a country club membership or anything like that. What we're talking about is in the context of the local church. Why is that a big deal? We live at a time when people are skeptical. Skeptical about organized religion, as it is frequently described. Skeptical about authority. Skeptical and slow to make commitments. And so why can't I just come and go as I please? What about this idea of membership at large? That when I feel up to it, when I'm interested, when I decide, I'll, I'll drop in and, and, and maybe I'm here one Sunday and maybe I'm in another place as a part of another assembly on another Sunday and, and really there's no rhyme or reason to it beyond what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking on that particular day. Why can't I just be interested in Jesus and that be enough? Why not just do what I can on my own and then, as I feel like it, drop in occasionally on various assemblies of the local church? We want to try and answer that question this morning using God's Word with three basic main points. What membership means, what membership says, and why membership matters. What membership means, what membership says, and why membership matters. Number one, you've got your Bibles open there to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What does the idea mean? Membership. We could do a quick scan of the New Testament and discover that the word membership, we're not going to find that in the New Testament. But we do find the root of that word, and perhaps most famously we find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the idea of being a member of something. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12, Paul reasons with Christians in the city of Corinth from the standpoint of their bodies. You know that, that as a body is one, you've got one body, and that body has many members and all the members of the body though many are one body that's an easily enough illustration to understand every single one of us has bodies and every single one of us has bodies that are made up of many different members and even though there are many members they all form one body but Paul wants to make it clear, we're not talking about anatomy here. Physically, that's the way it is with Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and the 14th verse of the chapter, he says, The body does not consist of one member, but of many. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 19. If all were a single member in the context of 
Christ and being of Christ, specifically here in the context of Corinth, if all were a single member, where would the body be? Those two things don't naturally go together. One body, so it is with Christ, and that body has many different members. Verse 20, as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Could I encourage you to keep a marker there, a little piece of paper or your Bible marker in 1 Corinthians 12. We'll come back there in just a little while. We see this borne out, this basic principle that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 throughout his writings. It's naturally, logically taken for granted in the New Testament. In passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1, we have identified who's writing. It's Paul and it's Silvanus and it's Timothy. And they are writing to people. They're writing to a specific group of people who live in a specific geographical location. And something has happened to these people. They've dedicated their lives to God. Now by the mercy and the grace of God, they are of Christ and they make up the church of the Thessalonians. It's precisely what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The church is a body. But that church isn't made up of one member, one person, or, or, or one small group of people. The church has many different members. And all of those members are different, but they come together to form one body. So it is with Christ in 1 Corinthians 12. So it is here, naturally taken for granted in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. These three men are writing to the body of the Thessalonians, each one of them members of that body. Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 1. What does membership mean? Use Paul's rationale, the Spirit of God, the wisdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we see that there were members of body. There were distinct parts of a whole. That's one of the, the basic ideas of membership. I am one distinct part of a whole. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. What does membership mean? It carries with it the idea, the biblical word of fellowship. When you had many different members who were all joined as a part of one body under the one head, Jesus Christ, the way that's described in the New Testament is with this word fellowship. It literally means we are jointly participating. We are in partnership. We are contributing together. Many different members of a body all headed the same direction. All participating. All partnering. All contributing together. It's the word that John uses in 1 John chapter 1 and the third verse of the chapter. First of all, in my relationship with God, then in my relationship with others. First John 1 and verse 3, John, why are you writing what you're writing? This that we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. We as eyewitnesses have seen things with our own eyes. We've heard things with our own ears. We observed with our own minds. And now it is such a great and a wonderful message that you need to hear it. It's centered not on your relationship with other human beings. That's a byproduct. But this good news is grounded in the idea that we can have fellowship with God. That somehow I can not only be forgiven of my sins, but I can come to be a partner with what God wants to do in the world. Not only can I leave the past in the past without any fear, but now I can participate with what God is doing to make things right in this world. 
in the lives of people who are alienated from Him. Not only can I lay my head on my pillow at night and and not fear the future, but I can contribute to something that is otherworldly. I can become involved in something that will echo long after my brief time on this earth is done. That's good news. Indeed, our fellowship, he says, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. But he says you need to listen in verse 6. If we say, those of us who claim to be partners and participators and contributors to the cause of God, if we say we're participating and partnering and contributing with Him while we walk in darkness, we're lying. There's no mystery here. It goes so far beyond what you say and, and, and what you're seeing and, and the mask that you can very easily wear in front of other people. This only makes sense. You want to be a partner with God. You want to participate with God. You, you, you want to contribute to God. you got to be like God. you got to do the things God is telling you to do. You can't claim to be do that and walk in darkness. But... If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship not only with Him, but now the byproduct is with one another. My identity is rooted first in fellowship with God. And the natural outpouring of that is everyone who is in fellowship with God, I am also in fellowship with. I am a part of a universal body of believers. We don't all live in the same place. We don't all speak the same language. We're coming from different cultures. And so practically what you find in the New Testament is local manifestations of that. Local fellowships. Where the good news is proclaimed, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, can cleanse us from all sin. We see it naturally, logically, practically borne out in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. People respond to the good news, to the invitation of Jesus Christ, and they devote themselves to what the apostles are teaching and to fellowship. We want to learn more and more and more about what God is saying and we want to grow in our relationship with Him and each other. That's what membership or fellowship is all about. That's what Paul is referencing in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9 as he comes to the city of Jerusalem and he spends time with James and Cephas and John and he says, listen, they appeared to be pillars among the saints there in Jerusalem, but they perceived the grace that was given to me and they gave me the right hand of fellowship. They recognized we're on the same team. We're a part of the same kingdom. We have been ransomed by the same God, given the same commission. And so wherever we are, these men as they go throughout the known world, we're jointly participating, we're partnering, we're contributing together. And what did they find? What did they found? What, what, what did they establish what did they seek to plant all over the known world local bodies of believers in Thessalonica in Ephesus in Antioch and on and on and on where fellowship in a very real local sense was enjoyed turn in your bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 if you will what does membership mean? It, it, it means being a member, a distinct part of a whole. It means fellowship, jointly participating and partnering and contributing. And it means submission. There were shades of that in 1 Corinthians 12. Listen, we are all members who are distinct but we're all working together. And the only way that can possibly happen is if we get in line. We listen to one another. We follow lead. And so we find in passages like Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, you obey your leaders. Listen to me. If membership isn't a biblical idea, 
who are these leaders? Who am I to obey? Obey your leaders and, and submit to them. That makes sense in a local context, the way that we've been developing from the pages of the New Testament. They are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. What does membership mean? It means being a member, a distinct part of a whole. It means fellowship, jointly participating and partnering and contributing. And it means following the lead of others, responding to the loving care of others. Which is why Peter, a fellow elder, as he identifies himself in 1 Peter chapter 5, says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject. To the elders. No doubt. We, we could go on and on and on throughout the New Testament and develop the idea of membership. It means being a distinct part of a whole and jointly participating and following the lead of and responding to the care of another. Go back with me to where I asked you to mark your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What does membership mean? Say We've talked for a few minutes about what it means. What does membership say? When I am willing to follow the, the, this biblical pattern and, and I want to be a distinct part of a whole and I, I want to jointly participate, I want to jointly partner, I, I want to contribute, I want to follow the lead and respond to the care of those instituted by God, by the wisdom of God. When I express that desire, what am I saying? Number one, I'm saying I want to belong. I want to belong. That's what Saul of Tarsus is looking for in Acts chapter 9. He has heard the good news and he's responded to it. And now he is absolutely on fire for the Lord. And so he comes to Jerusalem and he attempts to join the disciples. I want to belong to you. We have the same father, the same king in heaven. We've got the same mission. We've been entrusted with the same good news. I want to belong. I want to be a part of the whole. I want to jointly participate and follow the lead and respond to the care of others. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14. Listen to the reasoning. The belonging Reasoning. The body does not consist, verse 14, of one member, but of many. Let's talk about your physical bodies for a moment. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. The foot belongs in the body, just as sure as the hand. Verse 16, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. The ear belongs, works with, jointly participates and contributes as a distinct part of the whole body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of, of hearing me. No, we understand the whole body needs distinct parts that all belong. If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body. Listen to me. When we talk about membership in this local church, we're talking about it because God talks about it. Okay? Let, let, let's make sure that we get that in our minds. This is not about trying to grow an indiscriminate group of people. This is not about anybody's ego. This is not about any sort of earthly uh, 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 attaining of, uh, of any sort. We're talking about 
membership because it's a part of the wisdom and the plan of God. It is God, just as He gives us our physical bodies, God arranges the members in the body, each one of them as He chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Which means, listen to me this morning, church is not a place I attend. The church is a place I belong as a member of a body. Membership says I want to belong and I want to participate. We understand if I've got a limb that suddenly stops participating, I've got a problem. I'm headed to the hospital. Something is wrong. There is no such thing as a, a, a member, healthy member, active member, living member of a body that, that doesn't participate. It goes hand in hand. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. That's foolish. I want to participate with the hand. The head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. The head isn't going anywhere without feet. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, listen, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Do not believe the lie that you do not matter. Do not believe the lie that you have nothing to contribute. Do not believe the sometimes convenient lie that you can come and you can go and it really doesn't matter. It really has no sort of an impact whatsoever. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker, God says, are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. What does membership say? It says, I want to belong. It says, I want to participate. I want to enjoy fellowship in the context of Worship, for instance. The Bible reasons from that point of view that as we sing, we are as members of a body addressing one another. That we are teaching and admonishing as members of a body one another in all wisdom. This memorial we share in the cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ. Don't watch as a, a, a mindless, methodical, lifeless bystander. If you're a member of the body of Christ, don't do that as we're observing the Lord's Supper. You participate in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Membership says, I, I want to participate. I want to enjoy this fellowship in worship and in support. Did you know that that's the way the Bible describes benevolent work? That in the New Testament, just as there have been in all times, there are, are saints who are in desperate need, practically, financially. That the New Testament addresses this idea of widows. And he says, first of all, if a widow has family who is able to uh, help her and, and support her and, and, and aid her through life, do that. You don't do that and it's worse than an unbeliever. But if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened. Why? So that it may care for those who are truly widows. And the qualifications are laid out in 1 Timothy chapter 5. 
How does a church do that? Fellowship. Joint participation. Principle is laid out in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. There are very, very, very few individuals or families who are able to do that completely on their own. But churches have been doing that for a very long time. Jointly participating and contributing. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4, Paul references those who were begging earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Those saints in other places who were destitute and poor and suffering. And here are saints jointly participating, jointly contributing, partnering together and sharing in fellowship as that money is sent to the relief of needy saints. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, While I was there in Corinth, there were other churches who supported me so that I could be right here doing the work of an evangelist in Corinth. How does that happen? Very, very, very few individuals or families who are able to do that single-handedly. But churches have been doing that since biblical days. Because there is fellowship. Listen, you have a part in that as a member of this body. Membership means I want to share in fellowship of service. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 9 says, You show hospitality to one another without grumbling. One another. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified. He's the head. I'm just a member. And I'm doing what, my, what I can and what I say and what I do and how I give and how I serve. To make a difference. That is why God has instituted preaching and teaching and oversight and accountability to equip the saints for the work of ministry, service. So that as all of those individual members are working, guess what happens? The body is built up. Membership says, I want to belong. Membership says, I want to participate. Membership says, I'm willing to hold others and be held accountable. Paul reminds us at the end of this context, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27, you are the body of Christ. There's authority over you. And that authority has instituted other aspects of authority and accountability. I need to be held in accountability, which is why throughout the New Testament we read about overseers, for instance. 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 5. Shepherd the flock that is among you. There's a body. There are those who have been tasked as overseers, as elders, as pastors, they're described in a variety of different ways, you exercise oversight among the flock of God that is among you. That's why Paul institutes, the Spirit of God institutes the need to preach the Word. Be ready, he says to young Timothy, in season and out of season, with the Word you reprove and you rebuke and you exhort with complete Patience and teaching. I need to be held accountable because if I disregard the preaching and the teaching of God's Word and I disregard those who are tasked by God to watch over my soul, something's got to happen. And guess where it happens? In the context of the local body. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 references a very specific example of a man living in absolute blatant sexual immorality. And he says to the members of the body of the church in Corinth, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? 
Membership says, I'm willing to be held accountable. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Listen to me. If biblical member, or membership isn't a biblical idea, who's being purged and who's doing it? How does that possibly work? You see, the church is not merely some ecclesiological buffet where I just come and I go and I take what I want and, and, and it's, it's not something that I just dabble in or, or, or drop in when I feel like it. The church is a part of the wisdom of God created for my protection and my maturity for the good of others. Membership says I'm willing to be a part of the accountability of other people. Bodies sometimes have drooping hands and weak knees. Churches sometimes have members who begin to wander away from the truth. But James says if someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Listen, members of local churches need to know that if I begin to wonder, someone will come looking for me. It's a part of the wisdom, the plan of God. Turn very quickly, if you will, with me to Titus chapter 2. Membership means, membership says, finally, membership, why does it matter? It matters because I know, if I'm honest with my, myself, I, I need certain things. I know that I need to be a part of something larger than myself. You can see it everywhere. Human beings naturally long for that. Maybe I'll dabble over here in this gym, and maybe then I'll... I'll forsake that for the YMCA and then maybe I'll forsake that for the bridge club and maybe I'll exchange that for Kiwanis and on and on and on and on and on. We are built for community, built by God to be a part of something larger than myself. And listen, God in His infinite wisdom in Titus chapter 2 says older men need to be certain kinds of men. And older women need to be certain kinds of older women. And we discover very quickly, this is being spoken of in the context of the body. Older women are those kinds of women, not only because God wants them to be, but so that they can have an impact on other members of the body. Older women, God's, a part of God's plan is that they would teach what is good and so train the young women. And he speaks in verse 6 to younger men who need to be urged. Membership matters because I need to be a part of something larger than myself. Because in the wisdom of Proverbs 11 and verse 14, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Do you enjoy that in your life? Membership matters because I was created in Christ Jesus for work. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Christians, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Membership matters. Membership matters because we can do so much more together than alone. It's the idea of synergy. And you may not be very familiar with the word, but you're familiar with the context. You go this summer to the state fair and you will see 
synergy in action over and over and over again. You get a horse that can pull 9,000 pounds worth of weight and you get another horse that can pull 8,000 pounds of weight. What would happen if you put them together? Nine plus eight, that's 17, right? 17,000 pounds. No, something amazing happens. You put that horse that can pull nine and you pull that horse that can, or you get together the horse that can pull eight, you put them together and they'll pull 26,000 pounds. How is that? Synergy. They can do more together, so much more than they can apart. And listen, that was an unmistakable part of God's New Testament church. Acts chapter 2, verse 46, day by day attending the temple together. Breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were praising God together. They were having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Lord willing, you're going to hear over the course of the next few weeks from our elders about a number of different areas that need attention in the life of this local church. So many things that happen every week that are so very easily taken for granted. So very easy to get it in our minds that somebody else is going to take care of that. And listen, you get enough people thinking somebody else is going to take care of it. What happens? Nobody takes care of it. And that can't happen here if we want to be a New Testament church. There is very little that I can do in the support of people in Uganda on my own. But together, we're doing great things. There is very little on my own that I can do in spreading the good news in this local area. But together, we can do great things. There's very little that I can do individually in in helping a brother or sister who is in very great financial need. But together, we do great things. Finally, turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 12. Membership matters because I need accountability. You know that. It's the end of March. How are those New Year's resolutions going for you? We need accountability. And I would just draw your attention to a couple of the phrases here. I need accountability because in the language of verse 9, my love isn't always genuine. I need accountability because... In the language of verse 10, sometimes I don't do a very good job of outdoing others in showing honor. And in the language of verse 11, I need accountability because sometimes I get very slothful in zeal. And I need accountability because sometimes I'm not very constant in prayer. And I need accountability because sometimes I don't show very much hospitality. You get the idea. On And on and on we could go. How easily when we are on our own, we slip into ruts. Membership says, I need to be a part of something larger than myself. And I was created in Christ Jesus for work, work defined by God. Membership matters because we can do much more together than alone. And membership matters because I need accountability. Let's all use God's word and look in the mirror and make sure that as members of this local body, we're jointly participating, we're partnering, we're sharing. Listen, if you don't know what to do, ask. And if you asked a month or two or three months ago and there wasn't a whole lot to do, understand that so many were consumed with what was going on physically around us. But I know for a fact, you ask now and you'll get an answer. This morning, if you know that that first most important aspect of fellowship is out of harmony, out of whack, 
that you are not in fellowship with Almighty God. That's, that's where this starts. Listen, if you're visiting with us, we're not looking for your money. We're, we're not looking for anything other than the opportunity to show you what God has told you to do. People in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 heard the good news, but also the terrifying news of accountability and judgment of God. And they were moved to ask, what shall we do? And the gospel response in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 was repent. Turn away from sin, turn to God, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's where this starts. Make sure that as you leave here, that vertical fellowship with God is what it ought to be. This morning, if you are a child of God, you've done that and you've allowed that vertical connection to God to wane, to become weak and withered. Why not this morning? Why not do what you need to do? Because the day of reckoning is coming and that does not have to be a terrifying day. If we can be of any help as members of this body, we encourage you to come to the front of this auditorium while we stand and sing.